Okay, so good evening and or good day, whatever the time is, wherever you are. And thank you so much for joining us um, in this session. Um, our subject for tonight is um, the subject of how do we prepare for the event we call death? That's our subject. So let's try and make it a little bit lighthearted, shall we? Um, and, uh, you know, um, and please feel free to express your own opinions. You know, that's what we're here for. And I just also want to introduce uh, John Blackwood, who's an officiant of the Spiritualist National Union, to you all as well. So hi, hi everyone. Nice to see you all again. So um, is there anyone who'd like to start our discussion on how do we prepare for the event we call death? They're all rushing, Simone. Yeah, oh, no, oh, oh, Carolyn. oh, thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> Carolyn's got the first half hour. You, so I got what? The first half hour. So the <laughs> all, all right, that's fine. I shall just pontificate. <laughs> um, I'm I'm delighted you brought this up. I mean, because basically, when we're talking about you know communion with spirits, um, you know, that's what we're talking to people who've died. And um, you know, in our societies, we all know there's a reticence about talking about death, unlike the Eastern societies. And uh, I'm all for it. My, my history was as a nurse, but uh, you know, it's amazing how few people even get wills. I know was one person, uh, his wife was dying. In fact, she died within a week. Uh, and he was still denying the fact she had cancer. And he was, and she, he, you know, she was terminal, but it was kind of like he totally denied that fact. They weren't even talking about how they felt about each other. It was all, you know, stiff upper lip. No will had been planned. Um, you know, it's almost like my best friend who died a couple of years ago, she said her fear of writing a will was if she wrote a will, she would die. Oh. And only 40% of people in America and Britain have wills. And we just think, oh, you know, we haven't got enough to worry about. But if you don't have a will, then it goes to the government and then the government decides who's going to get your shuttles. And, uh, you know, you could have a very favorite piano and it could end up going to Aunt Maud and maybe you hate Aunt Maud. And unless you've written a will, you know, you, you're, it's out of your hands. So that's more on the practical thing. So, um, I mean, I've, I've just written a book and part of the book is about, is about just this because, you know, we, we um, think, you know, we, we, we think it's all handled. My uncle died and asked for me to be a executor. And his, he said to me, oh, don't worry, it's all handled. You know, the lawyer knows everything. Well, the lawyer knew nothing apart from his will. So my cousin and I would come across a drawer full of little yellow post-its with initials on it, meaning like it was like BOS. Well, that meant Bank of Scotland, they had money in the Bank of Scotland, but we didn't know the account number, which branch, anything. You know, and we get we arrange so much for, for for births and marriages, but we're all going to die. And it's like, why don't we just get practical about it? Write the will, sort out, write lists, even things like computer passwords and 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 phone passwords. Because otherwise your friends and relatives are really handicapped because they don't know them. Mm -hmm. So make it smooth, as smooth as possible, um, for for uh, um for them the, on the spiritual side i have a lovely story of a lady and gentleman who died within two years of each other strangely from uh benign not benign tumors brain tumors they both worked in a, as, as chemists and they were very near an elect, elect, electrical you know grid thing and i suspect possibly it was it was an unusual tumor and they both got the same tumor anyway he died first and uh and then she was dying and as she was dying, I literally saw this light come down from somewhere and it came down and I got this vision of this light coming down, meeting her light and the two of them circling together and lifting up together. It's like he'd come to, to collect her. It was just lovely. It was the most beautiful imagery I got, uh, unbidden, but it just it was just there. So now I've had my half an hour. I'll there shut you up. go. Well, the, the, the first thing I would say, Carolyn, is after this evening's session, 
I want you to send all your bank details and your passwords to me. Will you, will you do that? So that's part of your preparation. I'll take care of everything for you. You don't need to lie. So there we go. <laughs> but seriously, when it comes to, you know, obviously many religions talk a lot about, you're quite right, Carolyn, that they, they talk about preparing for that moment of meeting your maker or however you want to explain it and express it. Uh, but, and we spend a lot of time as spiritualists talking about what happens after that point of death. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, I don't think we talk at all about the concept or, or the journey to which we would get there. And, you know, obviously none of us want to think about it, even though we're spiritualists, but the, the concept of anybody passing. And I think one thing we all dread is the event and how we're going to go. So, so we tend to put all of those thoughts out of our head. And Carolyn, you know, obviously there's practical aspects we need to think about of our life in our lives, but what are the spiritual aspects we need to think about as well too? So if we believe that there's a life after life, uh, life beyond this physical life, uh, how can we prepare ourselves for that? Is what we do just now, does that prepare us? Does that set ourselves up for our next existence? Uh, really keen to get some of your views on that to see do you think what we do now, here and now, actually has an effect on what's going to come next? Or does it matter? Maybe it doesn't matter at all. Maybe we don't need to think about it. Mm -hmm. It's just one of these life events we just accept and we move on. But it's interesting that a lot of religions talk about preparing for that moment in the sense of making sure we live the best kind of life we can and and constantly assessing ourselves and judging ourselves, perhaps. Uh, I don't think we as spiritualists maybe do it, to, certainly for the event of death, we maybe think of personal responsibility and, and how it's important for us to constantly keep ourselves in check with our actions, our deeds and our thoughts, but it's not necessarily in preparation for something. And maybe we need to start to refocus our minds and think about that. So, so the question I'm posing, should we think about it? Is it important or does it really matter? Maybe it doesn't matter at all. I see Robert's got his hand up. We'll come back to Carolyn, but yeah. uh, Robert, Robert hi. jump in. Hi, uh, yeah, I was just, uh, when, just when you're talking about that, I was, I was just wanna share an experience that I had when, uh, it was one week I was at the, the Arthur Finlay College and we were all sitting around the dinner table and, you know what it's like if you've been there, you get to know the people that you sit with at, at dinner, breakfast and lunch. So uh, there was this old lady, old air lady, uh, I'll say, there, and we got talking and it was about the second last day and we got talking and we just kind of, we uh, were just asking each other what, what we were doing here, what interests we had. And she said that I had asked her the question, so what, what brought you to, to the college to do this week? And she said she was preparing for death. Wow. And it's I a was good place to go then, isn't it, really? Yeah. Well, yeah, I was quite taken aback by that. I thought, what? Because, you know, everyone else is, oh, I'm here to work on my development. I'm here yeah. to, you know, uh, you know, meet new people and stuff. Uh and she's just like, I'm here preparing for death. And as the conversation went on, she had said that she'd got to that, got to that stage in life where uh, it could happen anytime. She was she was in her 80s, uh, and she was saying that she thought it could it could she could pop her clogs anytime. Uh, and so she was going around the world, she was traveling, uh, doing different retreats and different looking at different religions and one of the one of the places that she ended up was the, the Arthur Finlay College. Uh, so she was on this kind of kind of pilgrimage almost going around the world looking at different religions, different aspects, philosophies on death. So she was learning. That was part of her preparation. Yeah. I mean, different she was, things, different Yeah, religions. she was learning different philosophies and how a spiritus, spiritualists looked at death, the process of what happened when we die, how it happens, where we go, etc. But she was looking at different world religions and all their other different philosophies as well. So I thought, I started looking at things a little bit differently at that point and uh, looking at things a little bit more deeper. But I just thought it was interesting yeah. that 
she took it upon herself when you know she can she had this concept of like her mortality mm-hmm. and uh, she kind of took it upon herself to like start to study what could happen, what was going to happen, and that in a that in a way was her preparation. Maybe, maybe so she could like deal with it from a mental point of view and an emotional yeah, point of view. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that's what she was doing, and I just found it really interesting that how many people actually not prepare for death, but think about it and think about the process and think about the aftermath both here and the material. And there maybe comes a time in life eh, that that's, you're more focused on that. As you yeah. said with her, she thought it's imminent for whatever reason uh, and she felt that needed to be a focus. So uh, I'd be quite interested to hear the rest of your views. Are you getting to that stage? So uh, no, is no, that no. important in your life? <laughs> Uh, just now, we'll ask Simone. We'll ask one of the older people today. So it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe there is, seriously, maybe there's that turning point that we come to in our lives uh, where we start to think it's almost getting that spiritual bucket list, isn't it? Mm. Maybe that's what we need to be thinking. I don't know. I'm, I'm, so I, I know I can see that um, Carolyn's going to uh, talk next, but the, the thoughts that are going through my mind at the moment are that I was, a, I was an atheist for a very long time. And my life was a lot easier when I was an atheist Mm. because you just didn't think about life after death. You didn't think about what was going to happen to you. You felt you knew. And and it was it was so much easier because you didn't have to think of your destiny. You didn't have to wonder about where are you going to go as an atheist, you know, (laughs) and I'm not an advocate. Please don't think that. But I, I do feel that. Um, having an understanding of the spirit, even a very small understanding in my case, I feel that it's given me an added responsibility that maybe um, I'm not always living with, you know, I'm not, I'm not, not always facing what happens to my spirit when I leave this world, you know, because I think it's more than just giving messages to loved ones here you know, so much more. And I think we we know so little about the spirit world because we're not meant to. I really do believe that. That's not ignorance, that I really do believe that because, you know, you can ask the spirit world and you can read as many books as you like, but I don't believe that they tell us exactly what the spirit world would like be like for us because it's purely personal. Because for me, the spirit world isn't an, a location, but it's a state of mind, a state of consciousness. So it, it just, for me, opens up a, um, another area of thought, which is to do with my own destiny, what I want to do with it, and how will that happen? And so, you know, I, I feel that um, preparing for, for so-called death, um, who knows until we get to that point, yeah. how, we, how we've prepared, because by but by preparing, I suppose, in my own small way, I feel that un- knowing, not understanding, not, not believing, but knowing that I survive physical death is a start. And I know that in my work as a medium, that I have, um, you know, there's always, there's always a load of um, myths surrounding mediumship, as we all know that, and I know that tonight isn't about that. But there is this myth that we disturb the dead. In fact, I gave a sitting to somebody today who said to me, I feel uncomfortable, this was her first reading, that I'm disturbing the dead, you know? And I said, well, first of all, they're not dead. And secondly, they want to talk to you. So you're not disturbing them, you know? But it does, I think that's what, um, the indoctrination of individuals through, um, through whether it's philosophy, religion, whatever, does scare people and uh, when it comes to death whether they whether they're thinking in the right way but I believe that in my own small way of understanding the spirit that that's already opening my mind to that power of acceptance that something great will happen to me I hope to god I won't get disappointed but I've never yet heard from anyone who's been disappointed as to where they are never you know that, that, that's interesting on two counts actually you you mentioned funny enough last month in our lyceum within the church we had a discussion about just the whole concept of being a spiritualist and 
and what it means to you. And, uh, and I did think about the concept of being a, an atheist. And years ago, I always had the, the view that actually being a spiritualist helps you because you have not just a belief, but a knowing and understanding mm -hmm. of the continuance of life. And that gives you a reassurance and takes away some of, remember one of our early discussions, it takes away the fear factor. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and and I, I think that's really important. However, I flipped that in its head when we had this chat and I thought, actually, do you know what? It might be much easier to be an atheist. Yeah, it because is. Because constantly <laughs> we're thinking about, oh my God, I need to think about what I do here or check myself and the responsibility we have. And mm -hmm. okay, people who are even non-religious perhaps have those thoughts too, but you know, I think there's a res huge responsibility we put on our shoulders as spiritualists to be good the best way we can. Mm -hmm. And the whole personal responsibility thing, if we take it seriously, is quite challenging. Absolutely. Whereas we could quite easily throw all that out and just say, do you know what? Let's just believe there's nothing. And then life actually might be much easier. Um, and that was a very strange concept. Uh, and we were, we were talking about that. Uh, but funny enough, it was yesterday, I suddenly thought, see, when we get to the spirit world, I wonder if we'll be disappointed. I've never, thought, heard, I've never heard anyone say that they're disappointed. And it was just interesting yeah. you said that. And I thought, yeah. actually, I wonder if it's maybe one of the biggest, you know, <laughs> uh, come downs, really, and thinking, oh, my God, you know, because we it? think of, of this <laughs> utopia, don't we? And this wonderful place. And I thought, well, actually... Maybe it's just the same. It's more of the same. And that maybe for another discussion, another night. Yeah. But, uh, but that's where I was yesterday, funny enough, when you mentioned that. Okay. So, uh, Carolyn. Yeah, that preparation, yeah. I think, was important. Yeah. Carolyn. Yeah, I think uh, I lost a friend very suddenly and unexpectedly. And I think it's really important. The thing that came from me for that, it's really important to tell the people that you love, that you love them. Don't just assume that they know um, because there's nothing worse than having somebody you care about, whether it be a friend or whatever, gone. Uh, and um, you didn't say you love them. And I think it's really important we don't say it enough because you never know when your partner walks out the door if they're going to be hit by a bus, you know. So it's like never assume they're just going to be, oh, I could do that next week or whatever. Um, so I think that's important. And I think for my spiritual clearing list, making amends, you know, trying mm -hmm. to say sorry to people that you've hurt. And if they are not near them anymore, you can write a letter. And the same energetics, you can write a letter, post it, or just simply put it up the chimney, you know, when it's far. But writing the letter gets the energy, mm. maybe the negative energy, out of you. And I think it's important to keep your nose clean and to make amends. And if you can't get hold of the person, then write a letter and you don't have to deliver it. Um, and the final thing about being more practical, and then I'll stop it, is that... Um, it's really important if you, uh, even if you're perfectly healthy now, is to write an advanced directive, which means that should you, God forbid, get hit by a bus and end up, you know, unconscious and uh, or paralyzed or whatever, write something down so that so that the doctors know, you know, do you want to be resuscitated? If you, you know, do you want to be given antibiotics? If you're beginning to be classified as a vegetable, do you want the doctors to give you antibiotics when you get a pneumonia, when the pneumonia can kill you off? Now, you may well say, well, my, my family will know, but you could have three brothers, just say brothers, and two agree, yes, you wouldn't want this. But if the third one, and I've seen this with particularly with parents, you have a child that hasn't really been around and all of a sudden, they come along and they go, oh, no, no, no. I know that my mother, you know, would want everything done. And then, of course, the doctors have to go to law or because there's doubt and there's a fear that they'll be done, sued for, you know, cutting off the, the ventilator, say. So it's really important to have it written down. And most medical clinics have these forms that you can fill out. Mm -hmm. So it's just in your medical chart. You may never have it used for 20 years, but it's there if you need it. Okay. That's it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else like to say a few words on this? Yeah, Daniel. 
Uh, yes, uh, I appreciate Carolyn being so practical. I, I realized my advanced directive is still in a file from maybe seven years now, and I keep telling myself I'll fill it out tomorrow, next month, next week. So thank you for the reminder, Carolyn. Uh, as we're talking, it, it really reminded me a lot of, of the change from uh, being raised the religion in my family and then coming into spiritualism. I was uh, always under the impression that it didn't matter what I did. I was doing everything wrong and that the only saving grace I would have is at the time of death. If I were to repent strong enough, I would maybe receive a pardon and would hopefully find the luck of the draw to be given another chance. Um, yet stepping into spiritualism was so um, empowering because I then was able to understand that each step I take uh, is an opportunity to change or to shift or to pivot how my life is going. But then uh, as, as others have mentioned, it then became this awareness of, oh, so I am responsible. It was almost easier believing that I could not do anything correctly and I would be punished. That was almost easier to accept than to realize I participate in this process. And for me, it gets to this place when, when I watched, um, when I watched, I got to observe and witness the passing uh, of a parent I wanted to do everything in my power to prepare him for death. And dad was funny, very humorous, always believed in loving God and always believed in love towards each other. And I would get frustrated, but dad, you have to make your amends. You have to let go. And he would just laugh and say, well, when I speak to God at the river, I'll let him know that we're gonna laugh together about all the people I, uh, I played jokes on and forgot to tell them that I was only joking. Uh, so, and, and this for me, sometimes I, I get too controlling where I realized I needed for myself for dad to accept what I thought he should versus um, simply allowing him to be. And I think for me, it's a reminder of how we can easily get caught in how easy it is for me to decide how someone else needs to prepare for death and then forget for myself how to prepare because in preparing, am I living my life or am I too strict following a code of conduct and no longer living? Mm -hmm. And I will admit for myself, I can think fully for spiritualism and awareness. It has brought me to a place of, of easing some of my fear. But you know what I'm most afraid of? <laughs> I laugh because this shows a little bit about my personality. I'm most afraid of what others around me are going to do without my input. Hmm. What, what Are they going to be smart or intelligent about it? Are they going to be reactionary or irresponsible? I fear more on missing out <laughs> on some areas of the control, if you will. Um, and some of it's based in love. And I'll be honest, some of it's also based in believing I know better for them. Um, and it's a very interesting place to be. And, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying this conversation because it really has, first of all, reminded me that Carolyn is the one I go to about my advanced directive. Uh, uh, and, and to realize I'm not being very practical in those, in those aspects. And I think it's important because, you know, we are living in a physical world. Yeah. And it's important to remember to stay grounded here and do the things I think uh, are not necessary. But I'm also becoming more aware of how much I sometimes focus on others' processes rather than my own. And so, uh, again, I'm really glad this, we can have this conversation and I'm looking forward to what Monique is bringing forward next. Okay. Yeah. Monique. Yes, hi, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, Pooh, how do we prepare for dying, for death? That's, that's a tough question. And for me, it's the best preparation is to live to the fullest. Yeah. That's for sure. To mm -hmm. live, to get all of life what we can and to... to step in that um, 
roller coaster of life and going through all the valleys and hills and conquer fear and getting an understanding of what love really means and getting an understanding of ourselves who are we and um it's a learning process and i've worked in the hospice and um for a couple of years and at people who were dying uh, at home and it's so different for everybody especially in this last couple of months weeks that that you know you're gonna pass and um everybody is unique in their way of preparation and it's for me it was also always an honor to uh, be uh, to witness how people get so um, vulnerable so honest all the masks are falling away people are so transparent and true and um, priorities are getting to the top of the their list what's really important who who exactly who who do you love who do you take care of and uh, let people know what you want to want to share to them and what Carolyn also did, making amends, very important, making amends, but also to yourself, forgiveness, forgive yourself, forgive others if possible and learn, uh, learn the concept of God, that spiritual part, learn, because I have seen in the hospice that some people didn't believe there was anything and which gave a lot of fear at the end because they couldn't let go because they thought, okay, this is it and the abyss. And I've seen people who were so um, having the, the feeling of and saw their mother, for instance, there was a there was a woman who saw her, her mother in the room. And um, so I confirmed that and which gave her so much confirmation that there is life after this life. So which in hospices isn't talked about a lot. Yeah. And that's a shame. And um, but to think about yourself about, OK, like Daniel, I I never th I think I live forever here. I, I live my life like I'm not gonna die. <laughs> and in fact, I know I'm not gonna die because I you know there's an afterlife. So, <laughs> so um, take take it's for me. It's like uh, take every day uh, carpe diem, carpe diem, and um, it's one big roller coaster. And learning to embrace everything, the the good, the bad, and the ugly, and learn to love myself learn to love another but starting with self-love which which is the healing part it's all about healing and yeah that's my point of view thank you thank you monique that's very interesting i just wanted to say to you um, over the last couple of years i'm coming across so many people who want to work or want to be in a hospice uh, to help to help those at the end of their life I, I, I should say to the point now, it's got to something like three or four people a week. I'm coming across that many people that want to work and, and to be of service in a hospice. And it isn't because people have got a fascination with death, but they can see how their power can help someone else's transition from this world to the next world. And I, and I know in my own case um, that the spirit world has worked with me on at least four occasions where I've been with somebody at the end of their life, but I hadn't known it was the end of their life. And within a few hours of me leaving them, they've gone to the spirit world. And I've now realized, if this is just my opinion, by the way, that it's one of the highest forms of service is to be able to help somebody at that particular time, you know, and just to help them in, uh, to find the peace to let go and if we believe what we if we if we really believe what we say which is that that world is a world of love and it's a world of you know harmony and balance and every every other good quality then we should be happy to see people go to that to leave this world and not suffer anymore knowing that there's a new life for them in eternity and yet we still, even spiritualists, still hang on to that physical body. And I know we're going to miss the presence. Of course we are we're going to miss that individual and their voice, their expression, everything about them, their personality. But when it comes to the end of their life, we should be happy to know that they're going into a new phase of life and not a phase of death. OK, um, Juliet, hi. Hi, hi Simone, hi Joe, hi everyone. 
And thank you all for saying what you said this far. Um, I've, of course, I've been thinking about how do I prepare for death? And a couple of years ago, I was very, very ill being in hospital, starting to become scared. And I was thinking, why am I scared? Because I have become a spiritualist. So um, that thought, only that thought, um, gave me so much uh, peace of mind. And I said to myself, okay, I know, I feel it's not my time to go yet. And, and now I have to think about how do I live the rest of my life? And um, Monique, it is a joy to listen to Monique and, and, and you know, her talking about uh, her uh, way of working these last years. I know Monique is very sportive and, you know, she is really a ta -ta 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 -ta, and I like that. <laughs> but um, at one point I thought, you know, when you, are, when you are elderly, if I look at the generation before me, especially the women, you know, it was just like they had nothing to do but wait, wait for the day that they would die, sitting behind the geraniums, etc. And I thought, you know, I like, uh, I am a soulist. I like to be on my own. I can be on my own very, very well. Never bored with, because there's so much to do. But at one point I thought, you know, how long is this going to go on? Because sometimes I feel that the problems of the youth, the young people are so huge. And when I start to think about it and there are young people needing guidance, Sometimes I think, you know, I can't handle this. How, how do I do this? Because I feel the urge to work with people. It, I, need, I need that in my life. I need that, that piece of being of service in my life. And why these young people, when I feel that I cannot guide them, and there has been those moments when I almost felt desperate and I, I thought, how do I go on? How can I cope? How can I be of service with these youngsters that have so many problems? And there's always an answer, there's always a light. There's always this guidance. You know what? just be yourself and tell them. But in that, in that telling, in that, in that guidance, there come the words. The words just present themselves. And they struck like a tone, a tone of, of understanding of a bridge, a bridge between the youngster and myself. And in that, I, I can feel so humble. And I understand that this is what life is all about. Being of service, having this ripeness of age, having the patience to sit, to sit with spirit, having the patience to sit with others, with these youngsters and just in emanating that love, there lies the reward for myself. And our last principle, eternal progress, open to every human soul. It is so dear to myself. And I think, you know, we shouldn't go sitting and waiting for death. Because maybe the pace that we, that we have is not as fast as when we were very, very young. But isn't that part of wisdom as well? Like, you know, everything happens in this moment. And if you can just hold on to the now, I mean, tomorrow will come. But 
we don't have to be too busy with tomorrow. And as Carolyn said, I have this, I have a husband who wants to be busy with the testament and with everything else. And I think, oh my God, I have no time for that. You know, it should be just ge generic. And, uh, but I, I do understand the importance of naming, naming certain things, you know, being for this or being for that or being allocated for, for, for different things. So I know, I know I should do it, but I, I don't think it's so important. So maybe it's just like I, I want to have that fail in front of myself. Like I don't want to be to be busy with that. With that, it's just matter, and who cares? But on the other hand, you know, I wouldn't want my children to fight, to fight over things. But knowing that, uh, well, we think that we know them, but I also know the stories of the children fighting when their parents die. So there is this testament, and you know there are all kinds of things, but I don't want to be busy with that. I just want to be busy with living, in, really living in the now, because who knows when I'm going to die? And I, I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow, but um, feeling what's coming my way is like, oh my goodness. I think I still have at least 25 years to go, but I'll have to take it one step at a time. And if I pass over tomorrow, well, I'll have to do it from the other side. So, so in, in preparing for that, you know, it's, it's with a smile and it's with, it's with uh, you know, um, putting up my shoulders and thinking, I don't know. So I'll just try and enjoy the now. And when I feel sad, and when I feel desperate, I have the ability thrown towards myself, like, you are loved. And that's more than enough for me. So I want to leave it at that. Okay, lovely. Because I know that I'm loved and cared for. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Julia. That was lovely. You're welcome. Thank you. Libby, would you like to share your thoughts with us? Good evening, everybody. Um, so, mine's um, from a spiritual standpoint. Um, I, I believe that the soul prepares us spiritually, uh, energetically, we change before we pass. I know we're talking a lot about the physical at the minute. But um, I wanted to bring in also the spiritual aspect um, because we don't actually have to do anything regarding, it's only my belief this, by the way, um, we don't have to do anything regarding ourselves and our own energy because our soul knows when we're going to pass and it energetically changes to allow us to take that transition uh, back home. And it is back home. Um, I know moving forwards, um, the spirit world are definitely bringing us more of a understanding of home to release that fear factor. Um, I know that I'm, I lost my mom and when she went to the spirit world, I walked in and I could just feel her energy all around me. I wasn't a spiritualist at that point, didn't have a clue about anything. Um, but I know from the spiritual standpoint that when we go back to consciousness, um, we lose this physical form and all our thinking within this physical form of fear, negativity, leaving people away. There's an aspect of each and every one of our loved ones up there with us. So we don't actually leave the aspect of our loved ones down here because on a spiritual standpoint, we are still energetically part of the collective consciousness. We're still with all our family. We're still with everything. Um, and when you start looking at it like that, with so much more than eternal beings, it, it removes the fear. It removes the doubt. We are so lucky that um, our souls have chosen a pathway where we are in our religion so open, where we can talk about um, being eternal beings. And we are just here in the blink of an eye. And yes, we must live in our physical form um, and enjoy our physical form. We're so much more than this physical form. We are uh, eternal energy. And because of that, I 
don't want to stay on this home, <laughs> but this isn't our home. And once we have that understanding and realise that consciousness itself is just pure love, um, and the essence of which is which is the divine that resides in all of us, it changes your mindset. And when you change your mindset, you change your own energy. Your soul's energy is changed. And that's what happens when we sit and we become spiritualists. Um, but my belief is that our structure of energy is changed just before we start to pass. Because energetically, we, we have to change to be able to take that transition. Um, it's also my belief that's why children are so um, not afraid. Because we are, in our physical form and the way we think, physically not spiritually um <clears throat> not our um conscious energy from the consciousness that we are we become a program don't we for fear and yet the fear is of what we have to go through and you know our loved ones around us we just seem to focus on the aspect of their passing or if it's been a hard passing but it's like looking at a rose instead of concentrating on the thought let's just concentrate on the petals on everything that they truly are and yeah we get to go home um, and when you've had a, a glimpse of the spirit world which a lot of us have or felt that pure divine love the fear is just gone it really has um so i just wanted to share that with you all um and it's only my belief no, that's that's lovely. Thank you very much, Libby. You just brought something to my mind. My my, um, I, a few years ago, as I was waking up, I heard the spirit world say to me, "Your father's spirit is preparing to leave his body." And I promise you, it's the last thing I would say. That's not they're not my kind of words. That's not my terminology. And I thought that was that was ridiculous. My dad's perfectly okay. But within three days, he was in hospital. But he actually he actually passed a couple of months after that. It wasn't straight away. So obviously there is a preparation that goes on within within that power, as you say. See, energetically, only my 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 opinion, understanding energetically, structurally, our soul has to change. So it's mm. our soul aspect that goes back, so it can permeate certain parts of the consciousness. Um, my mom knew she was going to pass months before she kept saying, I won't be here forever, Libby. Um, and I wasn't a spiritualist then, I wasn't awakened, I was in Libby land, plodding along. Um, yeah, but she knew, and energetically, she had picked up on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can sometimes look at people, can't you? And you um especially pictures animals um i will use animals as a better example and you can see in animals energetically uh them changing when they're mm. going to take their transition um so yeah it's so spiritually we don't have to do anything no. <laughs> muscles, yeah but we all think with the physical mindset because we're in a physical form a human form um so thank you for sharing that simone um no, just you just your words just resonated with me because I'd heard that and it's it was, you know, if 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 they were going to use my terminology, they would have said your dad your dad's going to die soon, but yeah. they didn't say that. They said your father is his, his spirit is preparing to leave his body. Physical form is just that. It obviously yeah. we don't yeah. need it, but we're energy at the end of the day and structurally that changes. You're prepared. So, yeah. Yeah. The it's new generation different. coming through have come with a very new energy structure. And because of that, they are, uh, they're just bringing through words as well in the trance where we've got more of a, an understanding of the consciousness. You know, so people's souls remember more. But obviously, we can't remember too much or we want to be here, not in a bad way, but yeah, because um, we're here for learning, aren't we? We're here to evolve ourselves. Um, so no, um, I just wanted to share that. I've never been on one of these in my life, so <laughs> I was very nervous, I won't lie, but thank you for listening, everyone. No, no, it's been very interesting. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. Okay, anyone else like to share their thoughts at all? Jo? You'll have to unmute yourself there, Joan, if you can see how she's, to do that. She's trying. I know. Yeah. yeah, she's trying. 
So maybe the bottom left hand corner. Yeah, I just sent the message. Oh. I sent you a message. Hopefully you can click the message. <laughs> Is that it? You? Yes. <laughs> oh, well done. Well, over the years, I've obviously I've been, I've had several, if you like, bereavements and people passing uh, to the spirit world. Um, most recently, I lost my brother um, back in October, and that was very difficult for me in some ways um, because I hadn't, although we spoke every week on the phone, I hadn't um, been able to see him, partly to do with the pan pandemic, but also question of distance. But I do think, um, but I don't think it's the same for everyone because I think as individuals, we pass in different ways. And my, 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 one of my phone calls with my brother was, um, he said that he felt that he was going to pass. He felt, he felt it. And he wasn't, he's not a, he wasn't a spiritualist. And I think he thought, you know, some of what I do a little bit airy fairy. Um, but, but he'd been ill for a long time. And he said, well, um, I just feel it. I feel. I said, "Do you want me to come?" And he didn't want me to go. And that, in a way, was the hardest part for me, because because of the distance, because of the pandemic, and all the rest of it. He didn't want me to go, but but he knew this was like I'm going to say about two months or maybe three months beforehand that he wasn't that he was going to make his transition. But obviously, some people they pass suddenly. Yeah. Don't they? Um, so there isn't that, but I had a similar thing, you know, 30 years ago when my mother passed, except it was a shorter, a shorter period. She said, deal with your flowers on, on, on Monday. She was actually telling me what to do about the flowers. So, you know, so there is that sort of, um, thing. All I'm saying is that, um, the, the day that my brother did pass, I mean, I'd heard from my from my niece that you know things were not good, um, and that you know they'd had one or two false alarms that had been called in, and then uh, you know, and then he'd recovered and brought back in that. But the morning he did pass, similar to what one of the other ladies said earlier, about four o'clock in the morning, I came downstairs, and I just saw all this. I'm going to say aura or different sensations of things happening. And um, then at nine o'clock, my niece rang to say that he'd gone. So I'm sort of assuming that what I saw at four o'clock was part of my brother's aura, or maybe it was just the spirit world that were drawing close to say he's going. But but he knew he was going. And that, that, that was really my point is that I think um but it isn't the same for everyone but some of us if we have a long illness as he had had um he knew he was going to make uh, that he was going to pass i don't think he knew that he was going to make a transition to the next world but i think he knew that he was dying so that's that's really all i wanted to say yeah no that's lovely thank you thank you joan that's great thank you yeah and i'm sorry about your loss too thank you <laughs> okay anybody else like to say a few words? Anyone else want to share? Yes, Roger, where are you? Gone. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Hi. Uh, growing up, I sort of went through all the different religions, Baptists and Methodists and Church of England. I was christened in Church of England. But I just feel that um, religion is a man-made thing. I think we all know that as spiritualists, but and I think it's the controlling factor and the indoctrination that confuses everyone. Um, there's a saying about, you know, treat every day as your last because one day you'll be right, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I don't like heights, so I'm not going. So. <laughs> but um, I've, I like uh, spiritualism because I'm not really uh, a practicing spiritualism. Well, I've been dabbling for the last 30 years. But I just find it uncomplicated because there's there no sort of books or you know like bibles or things and it, and it's um it's just a, it's just a thing built around um 
don't want to say silly really, but I don't want to say built on love, but it is basically because that's the basis of it from, from my point of view. And there's no complication with, uh, you know, confessions or, you know, you shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that, and all the guilt that goes with that. And um, I think um, people are going towards spiritism much more now because they're, they're uh, not necessarily searching, but they're just getting fed up with what's out there at the moment. I mean, some of the, the things that uh, one reads about different religions, how they control people, I think uh, it's frightening. And um, I forgot the lady what was said about the young people, but I, I think the young people are the same now as, as they, they always have been. I mean, I'm, I'm 79 now, and I can remember uh, when I was a child, um, you know, we, we, we all had the same problems, maybe not so the technical ones, like texting and all that sort of thing now and the online stuff. But I think we all had our um, respective problems in those days. And I think you just got on with life, you know, just you just try, try and do your best, don't you? I mean, if you see someone that needs a bit of help, you help them. But I mean, it's not the thing that, um, you know, you, how can you say, just be just be just be yourself just be a nice person basically and that's what i want to say really yeah i'm not, I'm not very good at expressing no myself. and i think you've done really well thank you very much roger you just reminded me of something that the spirit world told me a long time ago and it was it's not enough to know the spirit it's how you use it to move people's minds away from indoctrination that's what they told me you know and, you know, and that's what I, that, that's what, why I rebelled when I did when I was a lot younger um, against religion, because I didn't like the examples around me at the time of, you know, it's, it's so, I mean, when I look back, it's, it's so pathetic, really, but the, the woman that used to, um, that was uh, working in a, a Christian church and her sons used to shoot sparrows. And I couldn't understand that. I just couldn't put the two together. How could somebody be religious and allow their sons to kill birds, you know? And, you know, and that was one of the things I looked at. And then when, you know, later on, I started to look at the fact that in the UK, you know, it was illegal to attempt to take your own life. Mm -hmm. And then if you did, you were buried in unconsecrated ground. Until that, I think, don't quote me, but I think it was 1965 when that law changed. And that was through people pressure mm -hmm. and people decided. But can you imagine if you were a Christian and you believed that you were being buried in unconsecrated ground, that would be a, 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 your own hell, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah, but that's, that's because we're brought up with all the rules and regulations of no, that's what i mean by indoctrination yeah. you know yeah, that's absolutely. what we, that's what i mean and, you know, and, the and fear then of that. You know, all these yeah. poor all these poor kids that, that have been at school and they trusted their teachers and everything and all the terrible things that are coming out now yeah. about those teachers yeah. Yeah. and a lot of it not being done about anything and being done about it i think it's dreadful and i think uh you know as i said you just go with go with what you your feelings yeah. really absolutely but oh, what i was trying to imply was that sometimes people do do good, good 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 people do good things you know yeah, and yeah. and and laws change mm. you know and hopefully now people are becoming a little bit more open-minded not quite so black and white as they used to be because yeah. society has moved on hopefully intellectually you know mm. and that's what that's all we can hope for one thing I just like to say about I, I, I mean, I lost my brothers, my sister. I mean, I'm, there's just two of us left, and my eldest brother than me now. Um, but I had a friend um, a few years ago, and he had cancer, and he, he, uh, it was terminal. And I, I had so much admiration because he never once complained, and he was always upbeat. And we, I used to go and see him most days. We laughed and joke, and he'd say, "Will you say a few words for me?" And I thought, "Yes, I will," but I didn't think anything of it. And he said, well, the church is going to be absolutely packed. <laughs> we just had a laugh, but it, it, the, the, the church was absolutely packed. And I just yeah. say a few words. And the trouble is I get quite emotional sometimes. It was very hard for me because yeah, we've course. grown up together, you know. But um, I just thought how brave he was. I thought, well, I wonder, you know, when, when you're thinking about death, I mean, are you worried about what's ahead or are you worried what you're leaving behind? I mean the love of your family and your friends and whatever whatever your you know your things are 
because no no one's although we we've all communicated with spirit um no one knows 100 percent what's out there do you no i i yeah. totally agree with you yeah um I totally agree. Uh, mind you that's part of the fascination really yeah, yeah it, is. Um, it is because um the not knowing is 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 the thing that attracts me because uh, i think there must be something there because uh when you think like the tide goes out, it comes in, the sun goes down, comes up, the moon. So everything is a cycle. So why should life be different? Mm. I remember, yes. you know, you're reminding me actually of when my grandmother passed and my grandmother brought my family into spiritualism. And it was very much a preparation for her before she passed the spirit. So she did prepare for that event, but we did it together as a family. And it was a wonderful but sad experience at the same time. So we knew she was going, we didn't quite know when, and she was ready to go. But, and it's even going back to the beginning when Carolyn was talking about some of the practical aspects. Well, she did that literally just before she passed. She decided what would happen with all of her stuff. She decided what she would wear. She actually got the undertaker in and chose her coffin and how everything would look and how everything would go in the day. And you know, might think it's macabre, but actually it was a cathartic experience yeah. for everybody yeah. because she even cleared her house, which was amazing as well. She was in a, literally in a deathbed. She was still with us, Compass Mentis, but she said, see that, I want that to go to so-and-so. And she divvied everything up. And that was part of her preparation. And we used to joke, you know, if there was silence in the conversation where we go, are you dead now? So I then she would answer again. No, 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 I'm not away yet. So, uh, but it was a wonderful I'm experience. Abroad. And I thought, do you know what? It was great to have that time yeah. where, and, you know, we spoke about, I said, you know, when you go to spirit, you know, who do you, she lost her. She was, had a husband and she was very close with her mother. I said, who, who do you think is going to be there to meet you if that happens? So, and we spoke about that. And then she thought, you know what? I've been thinking about it. I don't know who I would want most, maybe both of them. I don't know. And these are conversations you don't normally have. Mm. And, and it was great. It was a great experience. So uh, maybe we need to think more about that. And just if we are lucky enough to have that special time, I guess, before we go, how are we going to spend that time and with whom? I'm amazed that you remember a Z bed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, uh, sadly, I think we're coming to the end of our discussion this evening. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to, to you all for, for coming uh, and for joining in, and especially for those that have um, spoken out a little bit. Um, I just want to say our next um, session is on uh, March, Wednesday night, the 9th of March. And the subject has <laughs> naturally evolved to the subject is God and religion. Okay, so that's our subject for the next month's session. But I would like to say thank you to Daniel for all his hard work behind the scenes. Thank you again to John for his very, very valuable contribution. And thank you all very much indeed for attending. I've really enjoyed this evening and you've thankfully made it a nice light subject, not one where we're all going away feeling quite down and depressed okay <laughs> but thank you again you've been really great thanks a lot and hi everyone take care